Hey, this is Digital by Computing, and today we're going to be talking about server security and the good things that you can be putting in place in a business to improve on your server security. So in this series, we're talking about security across a number of different technologies from server networking, storage, and a number of other infrastructure pieces as well. Today, we are focusing on server security and the recommendations that you can be putting in place to improve on your server security. In a world where cybersecurity risk and you know people trying to infiltrate, attack, hackers coming in, data being leaked out of businesses, it's imperative that you put the right systems in place to prevent these risks from happening. We want to mitigate risks. We want to prevent these things from happening before they occur. Once data gets leaked out of a business, it could have significant impact, financial impact to a business. Server security is something that is imperative for every single business. Even if you have one server, a hundred servers, or thousands of servers, you need to be putting these things into place to improve on your security hardening and your security of your service. Set up a domain and Active Directory. Active Directory is a Microsoft tool that lets you manage and control all of your computers on a network. This includes your workstations as well as your servers. Your servers need to be controlled, need to be mitigated from risk through this tool called Active Directory. So Active Directory essentially is the foundation for a lot of other security practices that we're gonna be talking about throughout this video. We can't implement adequate patching. We can't add, you know, implement adequate policies around password expirations and security lockouts unless we have Active Directory as the foundation. So Active Directory is going to essentially manage all of your servers in one centralized location to be able to control and you know, push out policies and make sure that they're all standardized and simplified across your network. With Active Directory in place, you then need to make sure that your servers are bound to AD. This is essentially having your servers not running standalone, but actually communicating into the Active Directory infrastructure. Servers communicate to AD so that AD now knows about those servers and then you can go and control those servers through Active Directory, push out pol policies, make sure that the, um, that the passwords are expired, making sure that you've got you know, resets, uh, lockout screens, you've got security warnings on your screen when you log into a server. Look at limiting or removing internet access for your servers. There's no real good reason that a server should need to go and access the internet. I log into a server, I open up a browser, I shouldn't be able to go and browse the internet. Browsing the internet essentially opens up that server to vulnerability and you could download a malicious piece of software, malicious piece of code directly onto a server. You don't even have to go via a workstation, via a laptop or a desktop if your server has direct access out onto the internet. Uh, there are some cases where some servers may need access to the internet. For example, a patching server or a server that needs to download certain pieces of software or updates from the internet directly, but they're generally going to be the exception and they're generally going to be isolated and controlled well enough that they are isolated from your internal network and there are procedures in place to protect that server from any intrusion into the rest of your network. Control access to those servers remotely. So in some instances, you may need to be able to access a server from outside of your office. Um, you may be able to terminal server into it to control it, make an update, and then you go. Um, this is not a good practice to have uh, by having something like RDP or VNC open on a server. You've essentially exposed your server out onto the internet for anybody to be able to snoop and see what is going on. The best thing you can do is set up something like a VPN, which is a trusted tunnel, it's a secure tunnel between your home, for example, and your office, you VPN in, and then from there you can get into the server. There is easy ways for people to be able to snoop on your network, snoop across the internet, across domain names, and figure out, oh look, this domain name is active, let's see what's listening on these ports. They can scan it, and if they see that the RDP port is open, they will try and they will try and they can continually brute force try to crack the password uh, and the last thing you want is somebody to be able to get into the server 
uh, through a remote service. Look at setting a five minute lockout policy on a server. Uh, if a server is idle for at least five minutes, have it locked. Uh, there's no reason that a server needs to be logged in or, or accessible 24 seven. If you need to access the server, you need to control into the server where it'd be through a, a virtualization technology and you're opening up the console through an iDRAC, through a uh, you know, RDP into a server, you should always, always, always have to put in your credentials to log in. Don't leave it open. Because anybody can literally just snoop in, they just connect into the server and if it's already logged in and it's not locked, they've got full access into that server. So get that five minute policy implemented. It's imperative that if you have servers in your organization, that those servers are backed up. Servers need to be backed up. They contain business data, business systems, customer information that is imperative for that business to operate. So if you lose the data, you could be in trouble, right? So make sure that you've got those servers backed up and that they are backed up regularly. Additionally, make sure that those server backups are sent off site. There's no point in having servers backed up and those backups residing in the same building as the servers and then your server room catches fire, your building burns down or there's flooding or something like this happens and then you've essentially lost your servers and you've lost the backups of those servers. So get those backups sent off site. They could be sent off to an alternate site, even to somebody's home or into the cloud where there are cloud services for managing those backups. But get those backups off site and get them done regularly, preferably on a daily basis to a secure off site location. Ensure that your servers are regularly patched. Companies such as Microsoft, for example, that will release patches every single month to your Microsoft Windows Server fleet. Microsoft released these patches for good reason. They have identified that there are vulnerabilities on your servers, on the particular operating system of the server. So that will release security patches and updates to fix these vulnerabilities. Look at limiting or controlling the local administrator um, credentials on a server. So if your server is bound to Active Directory, then it's likely that the server itself also has an active local admin account. The local admin account is nice if you need to be able to access the server uh, by not using the AD credentials. But the problem is a lot of businesses neglect how important it is for this password, this local administrator account, to be routinely monitored, checked and controlled. This is talking about resetting that password from time to time, making sure that the password is complex and making sure that this password is not the same across all of your servers. Furthermore, some people will say, look at disabling the local admin password altogether if your server is bound to AD. This has its pros and cons. I personally don't prefer to do this because if you do have issues with connecting to AD, then you could potentially be locked out of your server. So look at putting the right practices and policies in place, in place around that local admin. Limit your DAs and your EAs. These are your domain admins and your enterprise admins. Only the right people should have access to a domain administrator or an enterprise admin. You shouldn't be giving out this privilege to just anybody. Uh, this is essentially full access privilege to your entire Active Directory and, any, and anything connected into it. So give this permission sparingly. It shouldn't be given to every person in IT. It shouldn't be given to every service account. Use it sparingly. Only give it to a small handful of people that really, really need it. If you have file servers or file shares or folders out on your network, ensure that you've got adequate security and permissions in place across those files and folders. Don't just have it all open. If you have a file server that is accessible by everybody in the business, that's not a good practice to have. So different folders, different departments, HR should only be able to access HR, but finance should not be able to access HR, for example, and HR should not be able to access finance. Good example, uh, your marketing department shouldn't be able to go into your finance folder and see everybody's pay. So look at putting the right systems in place, the right permissions, against files and folders. We discussed the EAs and the DAs, the enterprise admins and the domain admins. These are very high level privileges. It's a good practice to have that anybody who uses a system from an IT administrative perspective should probably have two accounts. One that has the, you know, the relevant domain admin slash enterprise admin permissions if they need that. 
And the other account would be another standard administrator account that has access to other systems. Not every server should need to be accessed by a domain admin. You could access other servers through a standard admin account. Look at disabling earlier versions of SMB, in this case, SMB version one, protocol for file sharing that is unsecure. Newer protocols have superseded this and are already implemented and in use across your servers. So there's no need to be using SMB version one. Look at disabling earlier versions of SSL and even early versions of TLS. Similar to the SMB, the SSL and TLS earlier versions are legacy now. They have security vulnerabilities that have been thought and, and, and found out. So there are newer versions of TLS, newer versions of, T, of TLS security in place that supersede these early versions. So you don't need to be using these early versions anymore. Look at putting a system in place to monitor your DHCP logs. From time to time, it's good to go into DHCP and see what's going on. Review your logs and see what computers have been getting allocated IP addresses. If there are unknown computers or unknown MAC addresses that have been detected in your DHCP logs, it could mean that somebody has been allocated an IP that you did not authorize. Somebody could be plugging into the network and they've just been given an IP and you don't know who this person is. So just put into a good routine to go into DHCP and see what's going on. Use trusted certificates on external facing servers. If you've got a server that is web facing, that is, for example, hosting a website, Get that server with a trusted, like a trusted certificate from a certificate authority. Don't use self-signed certs for external facing sites. Use the HTTPS protocol with a secure certificate attached to it from a trusted security advisor. Remove legacy operating systems. There are similar to what we talked about patching of uh, Microsoft servers. Uh, Windows 2003 is, is a legacy server that server no longer exists. You can't get 2003 anymore. So Microsoft will not release patches for server 2003, which means if you're running legacy operating systems, then those operating systems are essentially open and vulnerable to attack. There's no reason to be running older operating systems. If you do have software running that can only run on these older ones, look at upgrading the software or look at changing software vendors because that software could be putting your servers at risk if you, if you are running an older version of Microsoft Windows or any other flavor of server architecture. So that was it on server security. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, next time we are gonna be talking about network and firewall security and the things that you can be putting in place to improve on your network hardening security footprint. I would love it if you commented and also write me if you have any comments. I would love to have a dialogue with you and subscribe to my channel. There's a lot of other videos that I do have on my channel around a lot of different technology topics. Love it if you commented. We'll see you next time and have a good day. So if you found that video helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel, Digital by Computing, just on the button there for more videos.